Good evening. It's good to be with you again tonight on this Friday evening. Reverend Chelsea and Joy and I are here again tonight to offer the ministry of worship, of prayer, of hearing God's word, and of preaching tonight. And so we are glad to be with you in this new way. Uh, we hope that the other night, the service that you saw was something that was helpful for you. And we're glad to be here with you again tonight. We'll be here again on Sunday. We're going to um, videotape a church service for Sunday morning and then have it sent out to you in whatever way that happens. And hopefully you'll get the link by close to 10 o'clock on Sunday morning so that you and your family might sit down and share in a service with us on Sunday morning in this new way of being church together. And so I hope that you're well. Um, I hope that uh, these days um, of isolation and possibly loneliness and for some of us busyness, that you might be keeping well and caring for one another. We are all doing okay. Um, our families are well and we are sorting out how to uh, do ministry as well as life together. So let us begin our service tonight. And it's another Teze service, and you'll have the leaflet hopefully emailed to you in the same uh, email in which you receive the link to this. So we'll start by singing a couple of Teze songs. Join us as you are able.
for God alone my silence, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall never be shaken. How long will you assail a person? Will you batter your victim, all of you, as you would a leaning wall, a tottering fence? Their only plan is to bring down a person of prominence. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they, cor- they curse. For God alone my soul waits in silence, for my hope is from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. A reading from John's Gospel, John chapter 4, beginning at the 27th verse. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Just then, Jesus' disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back into the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to see him. Many many Samaritans from the city believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. The testimony which said, He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. This is the gospel of Christ.
And I speak to you tonight in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As most of you know, I like to keep busy. I enjoy working, being a mom, baking a cake, organizing a cupboard, and visiting with a friend, all on a Saturday afternoon when I'm actually supposed to be writing a sermon. <laughs> Steve can testify to this fact. And sometimes, just occasionally, I try to fit way too many things into a day or a week. There's not often much white space in my desk calendar. And I suspect I'm not alone in this. Many of you, many of us, are likely similar. We delight in doing things, we delight in projects, whether it's gardening or baking or work things or outdoors activities or building a fence or a new garage. Um, we delight in having goals, in having trips. We delight in accomplishment. But many of us don't have a lot of white space in our calendar either, and we are often quite busy. And so it's with this spirit of busyness and uh, a, a calendar that is often overflowing that we return tonight to the story of the Samaritan woman and Jesus. It is such a rich gospel story that I thought we would take another crack at it tonight uh, and look at the second half of the story. If you're jumping in halfway through, a quick recap is that Jesus met the Samaritan woman who was sitting at a well all on her own in the middle of the afternoon. Jesus and her have a lively discussion about what kind of water it is that she is drinking. Jesus offers her water that will make her not thirst ever again. Jesus offers her living water. Jesus offers her himself. And so we pick up the text today with the disciples returning. They've gone to get food, and they see Jesus talking to this woman. And they wonder at why he's talking to her, but they don't really say anything. It says in the text they don't question him. But soon after that, the woman runs off back to her village. And so this woman has had an encounter with Jesus that has changed her life forever. She's transformed and she can hardly contain her joy and excitement at how she has encountered Jesus, who knew everything about her. She has experienced just a taste of living water. One theologian remarks that she came for the water and she left with the well. She received living water. And she knows it. She feels it down to the tips of her toes, deep within her being. And she longs to share this living water. And it's interesting to me that she longs to share it with the people who treated her terribly, who rejected her, who made fun of her, who caused her to be an outcast, who caused her to have to go to the well in the heat of the day in the first place. But she was transformed. She had learned and experienced something that she was determined to share. And so she goes tearing back to the village, leaving her water jug behind, and she says, come, come with me to see this man who knows everything about me. Could this actually be the Messiah, she says to them. And she tells about her experience, and we get the sense that she is almost vibrating with joy about what she has encountered. And so we're getting to the, to the part in this story that I find most interesting and ties back into this busyness I was talking about. Because we see that the whole community then comes out to greet Jesus as he and the disciples walk back towards this woman's village. And they greet him and say, will you stay with us? And this is the part that I find fascinating. Jesus says, yes. And he stays with them for two days. He stays with them not just for five minutes on his way by, but for two days. Who has time for this? Who would actually, in their calendar, if somebody approached them and said, hey, do you want to stay for a two-day visit? Most of us would say, well, I actually probably would like to, but I have a hundred things that I need to do. Surely this was not in the official schedule of Jesus. The disciples were likely horrified by this change in the itinerary, as Jesus simply said, Yes, I'll stick around. And so, on the one hand, I am absolutely taken with Jesus' ability to be present in that very moment, to stop what he's doing, to not say, no, I need to be somewhere else, to be nudged and prompted maybe to say, okay, 
This is where I'm going to spend my time. And to sit with people for two days and to stay by their side. To know that this is where he needs to be. And with all the people that he could have been sitting with and giving of his very precious time, he chooses Samaritans. He chooses people that were not on the A list that were not maybe again in the disciples' itinerary of who needed to hear the gospel, of who needed living water, of who Jesus was there in the first place to save. I have to admit that I long to be more like Jesus. I long to stop what I am doing and to be present to those who pull at me and nudge and say, will you sit with me? And I think first and foremost of my kids when I'm making dinner who pull at me, who tug and say, Mom, come and see this Lego that I just made. Or, Mom, do you want to come and do a puzzle? Or do you want to read with me? And I'm too busy. I long to be like Jesus, to sit down and to be present. It's the beginning of a great reminder for me this night. And so on the one hand, I'm taken with Jesus' ability to say yes and to sit with these people. And on the other hand, I am deeply intrigued and curious about how these Samaritans, convinced, cajoled, maybe manipulated, I don't know, how did they get Jesus to stay? What did they do? How did they, how did they do it? What made their invitation and their ask anything different than somebody else's? How did they get Jesus to say yes and to stay with them? Again, they weren't on the A-list. And so a wider question, and one that maybe expands this beyond how did the Samaritans get Jesus to say yes, is how do we, how do all believers, how do all people seeking God, how do we get Jesus to abide with us? How do we get Jesus to stay with us, to abide with us? The answer to this question, I think, unfolds in the entire gospel narrative from start to finish. Especially in John's gospel, we hear about what it means to abide in God, to be with God, and how God abides with us in the person of Jesus Christ. And so the answer is a much longer answer than what we have tonight, but the first part of the answer, I think, is found in the three letters in this story. Ask. They asked. They were asking Jesus, would you stay with us? And he did. They simply asked. Dale Brunner, who is a biblical theologian with a wonderful book that uh, I received this uh, theological commentary on John's gospel, and it's, it's bigger than the Bible, um, and I haven't really had time to invest in it, but as we all know, we have a bit more time these days, and so I cracked it open this week to look at this gospel. And so he has some wonderful insights about this story. But one of the things he says is around this ask. He says, one gets the honest impression from our gospel that having an abiding, staying relationship with Jesus is not to be made or found through the fruits of a complex spiritual regime, but actually a staying relationship with Jesus is as simple as living an asking life. Living an asking life, says Brunner. What a powerful image for you and for I right now in this time and space in our world. What does it mean for us to live an asking life? I have this image of being open, of asking Jesus to stay with us morning, noon, and night. Jesus, will you abide with me? Jesus, will you abide with me in my fear? Jesus, will you abide with me as I attend to my job and my children? Jesus, will you abide with me in my loneliness, in my room, in my apartment? Jesus, will you abide with me in the long silences of the night? Jesus, will you abide with me where I am today? And the answer to these and all of our asks is the same. In the same way that Jesus says to the Samaritans, yeah, I'll stay with you for two days, like it's nothing and I have all the time in the world, I do believe that this gospel narrative actually says to us, sure, Sue, I'll stay with you. I'll stay with you as long as you want. What a wonderful thing to receive today. 
sure, I'll stay. It reminds me even of if we invite our friend, they come to the door just to hand us something, not right now, obviously, <laughs> but normally, in, in normal circumstances, if someone comes to the door, maybe to drop off your mail, um, and you say, would you come in and have a cup of tea? Isn't it wonderful when they say, sure, I have time for that, and they come in and we sit and we have a cup of tea together and we talk. Isn't that a wonderful feeling of, yes, you have time for me. We can spend time together. Well, multiply that by an infinite number, and you have the feeling of what it is, I think, to say to Jesus, will you abide with me? And for Jesus to say, yes, I'll stay. I have all the time in the world. There is nowhere else I need to be. Ask, and it shall be given unto you, the scripture says. And so what does it mean for us today to live an asking life? I had a parishioner email me this week. Reverend Sue, she said, I've always fixed things by running faster, jumping higher, and trying harder. All of a sudden, the rules seem to have changed. Having to rely on prayer makes me nervous. It makes all of us nervous. It scares the living daylights out of us right now. Most of us are scared from the moment that we wake up until the moment that we go to bed. We have no idea how to fix the world right now. We can't run faster. We can't jump higher. We can't try harder to fix this. And the rules certainly seem to have changed. And so where's the good news in this tonight? Jesus' response to us is the same as to the Samaritan village 2,000 years ago. Jesus will stay with us. Jesus abides with us. Jesus requires nothing of us. We don't have to be good enough. We don't have to be smart enough. We don't have to ask in a certain way. We don't have to have all of our life sorted out. We can have a life full of junk, and we can still ask, and Jesus will stay. We don't have to run faster or try harder or search deeper. We only have to ask. And for someone who sometimes feels like a professional Christian, this comes to me as an immense relief these days. All I have to do is ask. I don't have to be anything else. And so I ask tonight, and we all ask, that Jesus might spend time in my heart, in our hearts, in our community. That's it. Ask and you shall receive. And we receive through the divine work of that life-giving water, the Holy Spirit. We receive divine presence, comfort, and peace. And so we ask this, nice Je this night, Jesus, would you please stay with us a while through the watches of this night? Amen.
in this time of loneliness and isolation, we bring to you tonight our prayers for ourselves and for the world. God, we pray for the sick and infected. We pray for healing, help, and hope, and that you will sustain bodies and spirits affected by illness and help to stop the spread of infection. We pray to you, Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those in our communities who are most vulnerable, for the chronically ill and the elderly, we ask that you will protect and provide these communities with comfort and care. Lord, hear our prayer. For our local, provincial, and national governments, that you will provide our elected officials with compassionate wisdom as they distribute the necessary resources for struggling against the COVID-19 pandemic and other difficult situations. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the homeless, unable to practice the protocols of social distancing in the, in the shelter system. We ask that you protect them from disease and provide isolation shelters and good nutrition in every city. Lord, hear our prayer. For families with young children at home for the foreseeable future, we pray for your comfort to mothers and fathers to partner together creatively for the care and flourishing of their children. We remember especially single mothers and fathers and that you will help them to grow their networks of support. Lord, hear our prayer. For college and university students whose courses of study are changing, whose placements are canceled, whose graduation may be uncertain. Faithful God, show them that while life is uncertain at this time, their trust is in you and that you are faithful. Lord, hear our prayer. For residents in every neighborhood, community, and city, we pray that your Holy Spirit will now, more than ever, inspire us to pray, to give, to love, to serve, and to proclaim the gospel that the name of Jesus Christ might be glorified around the world. Lord, hear our prayer. May, may we be witness to your light shining in the midst, in the simple acts of love and care that you call us to give at this time. May we be stretched in new and creative ways to care for ourselves, our families, and those we may not know yet. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
It has been good to be together with you tonight. Thank you to Joy and Chelsea for your music, your prayers, and your presence. And so we continue to pray in the watches of these nights for God's mercy and God's love. And now may the peace of God, pass, which passes all of our understanding, guard both your hearts as well as your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ. In the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit remain with you and everyone that you love tonight and always. Amen. <laughs>